Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. By Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. By RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. By New Home, changing the way America sews. By Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. And by American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. For some of you and we're new to some of you we've got a series called the great american quilt and it's all about quilts we've tried to think of whatever you would like to see about quilts we've got beautiful antique quilts we've got terrific contemporary quilts some of them are really pretty far out and we're going to start each program talking about history and in particular what life was like for the women who made those quilts we've got an old favorite of a lot of people the log cabin quilt and we'll not only see the quilt and its design, but we'll really look at what it was like to move into a one-room log cabin home. Imagine her feelings when she first saw the log cabin. She thought it was a joke, or perhaps he was showing her a barn. But no, this was to be their home. Another features wonderful flag quilts. When we talk about how women sewed thousands of quilts to raise money for soldiers during the Civil War, We'll even see some of these flag quilts warming office walls today in a Long Island toy company. We'll talk about how women's lives were changed by a fantastic new invention, the sewing machine. And I'll show you some wonderful pieced picture quilts that developed after women could sew quilt blocks by machine. I have about two months sewing to do. I never was so tired of sewing in my life. My fingers are worn out. We'll talk about romance and share the mysteries surrounding one wonderful bride's quilt from the Museum of American Folk Arts collection. And we'll even eavesdrop on gossip that went on at a quilting bee 50 years ago. I remember Mrs. Jessen as being slow moving and slow of speech and rather dramatic in her storytelling. Too bad I can't remember the story, but all I can remember is the ending told very dramatically and a little breathlessly. And when the little dears were born, they didn't have any eyes. After we've looked at history, I'm going to hand you over to our two how-to experts, Diana McClun and Laura Nouns. Now, they've taught thousands of quilting students how to quilt, and they also know how busy you are. So they've developed some really quick and easy methods. These methods are going to be perfect for the beginner, but they are also really full of tips that even the old hands at quilting will enjoy. Their quilt blocks and whole quilts combine traditional quilt design with a real contemporary sense of style. If you sew a new block with them each week, by the end of our series, you'll have the makings of a scrap sampler quilt, and they'll even get out the quilting frame and show you how to quilt it. Then I get to do something that I always like to do, and that's show you some really contemporary quilts and show you how tradition gets pulled a little forward into the future. We've gathered a wide variety of quilts by people all over the country. Here's one that we'll be looking at with you later, done for the peace movement. This is by a group of women in Boise. But wait till you see some of the other quilts that we've got that have everything on them from sequins to being done with bowling shirts. Some of them have paintings, some use embroidery to add details, and some are just reinventing classic designs. Also, some of the quilts have stories to tell, and so we'll listen as we look. The story of this quilt unfolds as the main character waves goodbye as he starts out on his journey, carrying an empty basket on his back. Rabbits sit in the meadow, fish swim in waters, and a friendly fox runs quickly past a rock. We'll even look at how the computer is being used to design quilts today. 
We're out to celebrate what's going on in quilt making today and to show you how you can become involved. We'll see quilts made as statements against racial conflict, homelessness, and domestic violence. And we'll show you ideas on how you can make a quilt to give to someone who needs one. We know that a lot of you have family quilts that you want to know a little bit more about. So we've got a resident quilt expert, Rod Kirikoff. He'll be with us each week and he'll take a look at some of those popular favorites that your mother and your grandmother probably made. And then we'll take a look at the present and interview some of the best known names in the quilt world. We'll get tips on dyeing fabric from Jan Myers Newberry. Sonia Barrington will show us it's actually easy to marbleize fabric. Judy Warren, Susie Shy, and Terry Mangott will tell us how they incorporate mixed media techniques into their work. And we'll see what Nancy Crow is doing to the old quilt favorite, the double wedding ring. We'll even talk to editor Bonnie Lehman to get her overview of today's quilting movement. And to top off each show, we'll show you a dazzling display of quilts made by quilt artists from coast to coast. Quilt making has never been more alive, and we're going to hope to show you this in the people that we have here and the wonderful quilts that we've brought together for this show. So we hope you'll be with us on The Great American Quilt. Now that we've given you a little sneak preview, we're going to start right in quilt making. Diane and Laura have a very easy block for those of you who are just beginners, so don't worry, you won't get lost. They're going to start by showing you how to use a rotary cutter on this block, which is the rail fence. We're going to be covering the scrap sampler and in a 13-week series. We hope that you'll really enjoy being with us. This one uh, was done by Sally Barlow and she was a student and she completed it in 13 weeks. Oh, isn't that incredible? We designed this quilt with you in mind because we know that you have real busy schedules and families and jobs so we're going to be showing you lots of quick and e easy methods for cutting and sewing your pieces together. And we're going to be covering traditional blocks. Notice the one down yeah. in the corner, the log cabin. I bet they've heard of that one before. <gasps> I bet their grandmother has one. Uh -huh. And then there's a memory, and of course we love little house blocks, oh, and yes. you will too. That's right. Attic windows, and today's block is fence rail. Right, this one will teach you some new methods perhaps. It's called quick cutting and strip piecing. And we're going to uh, get started with that, right? That's right. Um, Diane and I both like to use 100% cottons when we make our quilts. I, I think we, um, we both feel that they work so much better than the polyesters or even the polyester cotton blends. And we really like to have uh, fabric that hasn't been pre-washed. Mm -hmm. The reason is, is because we like those chemicals that prevent mildew and... Uh, Soiling. Right. Mm -hmm but we don't like our fabrics to bleed <laughs> or to release color. So we have a little trick for you, though, we with do. this water. No, I'm not taking a <laughs> drink here. <laughs> Take a little swatch, mm -hmm. two-inch piece of water, and let it get right down there. Now, we do this with all of our dark fabrics, especially dark red and dark navy blue, or dark blues and bright colors, you know, those that um, have excess dye in. And when we find, though, that this water has turned up just a little pink, we're going to what? Mm -hmm. There is a method to set that dye, and you can use, or I should say, you have to use full-strength white vinegar. You might have read somewhere that a quarter of a cup in a, in a full tub of water is going to do it, but it really, it's not strong enough. You need to take your piece of fabric and just soak it in that. Not very long, just a couple minutes, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we know some of you will want to pre-wash yours. So just take your fabric and put it into a basin of warm water and wring it out and then take it into your dryer and let it, when it's just damp, dry, take it and press it. And if you want to then add a little spray starch or something mm -hmm. to it to give it its crisp look again, that's okay too. It's a good idea. The first thing that we're going to do though in quick cutting is to take our fabric and line it up so that we can cut. Well, you notice that we've got a new tool here um, in fact, several new tools mm -hmm. to uh, be able to aid us in, in quick cutting. The fabric, though, is always lined up with the salvage edges. So if you will put your salvage edges together, then you can see, though, as I turn this around, that maybe the fold line isn't quite even, and 
let's line that full line up also so that just shake it out a little bit and as it comes and up there straight and then we're ready to now go down to our cutting surface and notice that this has wonderful marked lines on both vertically and horizontally and I can just lay this down here and I'm going to bring up now my folded edge now this is important that this lines right up on there and we'll put this nice wide plastic ruler and we will just give this a cut so we can straighten up the edges because I want this edge straightened and this edge straight. So this ruler is going to help me to do that. This is a rotary cutter. Now my rotary cutter has a nice grip on it so I can just give it a good firm press notice that I'm holding my ruler with, mm, I'm going to give this <laughs> lots of pressure. Right, nice and smooth too. So many people look at this and they think of it as a pizza cutter mm -hmm. and they want to do just exactly that. So just uh, force yourself to give it a nice smooth cut. Now your uh, strips will be cut one and a half inches. So I'm going to cut this now one and a half inches and look at how simple and quick that <laughs> you went. You are quick there, <laughs> oh my goodness. Take a look here. I want you to see the strip. Can you see the bend here? where the fold of the fabric was. We've exaggerated just a little bit, but this will happen to you if you're not real careful with the initial folding of your fabric. So if this should happen, then you need to take a minute, go back, refold that fabric, and then start cutting your strips. Now I have cut these into pairs, and Laura was, mm -hmm. uh, these are the maybe get them sewn up. strips for the fence rail, and you can see that I have them arranged here uh, from light to dark, the six strips. And I'm going to sew them together in pairs. I'm going to place them right sides together and I'm going to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Now this might be new to you, especially if you're coming from a dressmaking background because you are accustomed to using five eighths of an inch. Well in quilt making we don't have that much allowance and because it's such a small amount you need to have a real accurate quarter of an inch and you need to find that on your sewing machine. You can use a ruler. Uh, to find the distance from the needle over to the pressure foot and maybe mark it with a piece of uh, masking tape. Or you may have a machine that has um, an adjustment button where you can move it back and forth to find an accurate quarter of an inch. Okay, I've joined this together in pairs and now it's ready for... You can see now that the seam is just a little bit ripply and I want to, sometimes I just take my fingernail and go down that, but it's really better if you will press it with your iron. So just up, down, up, down, onto that, and just make those stitches flat. Then I'm going to just simply fold my dark side over, and I again run my fingernail down there. Now notice the edge of my iron, though, as I put it on there. It just comes right on that seam, and over it goes, and see how smooth and flat that is? Now let it cool. Do not pick this up until it's cool, because if you do, it will wave just like that. Oh, that's right. Now I'm ready to put them together. All right. Join the pairs together to form a, a unit of strips, all six of them together, and then you'll give it a good final press so that all the seams are going in the direction of the darkest fabric. We're ready now to cut the strips apart. Mm -hmm. But first, let's just take a quick look mm -hmm. at these seams. All pressed towards the dark here, nice and straight, and I'm going to now line up on my cutting mat here and first I'm going to just cut this off uh, to square it up here. And then I will cut over six and a half inches and give it another slice. And then I will just repeat this four times and we have the four blocks here. That's right. And let's arrange these blocks as they're going to be sewn together. Take a look here. This is an easy way to remember so you don't get them out of order. The first block, the strips are going up and down, and the dark strip is, is first. Then we have side to side, dark strip first. Let's reverse it. Side to side with the strips, dark first, up and down with the strips, and the dark first. Now join them together in pairs, just like this. Let me show you what the pairs look like. Here we go. Okay, whoops, I'm sorry. This way. And now, final stitching line, just like this, right through the middle, and then give it a good final press, and that completes your 12-inch fence rail. And now we have the fence rail put into a quilt. 
Oh, it's just gorgeous. It's, it's nice to see the stair stepping go up and down. And that little red is just poking in and out here. And I like the contrast of the white that separates it. Oh, Laura, you did a great job oh, with that. Diana, oh, Diana, look at this. <laughs> this spring fond this, memories this back. Like, like my warm blankie, isn't it? <laughs> uh, remember, this was the first one we did together. It was. I just get goosebumps over it. Uh, I hope that you'll be able to have fun making your fence rail this week so that you'll join us for the scrap sampler next. That's right. Now that's just the first of all the blocks they'll be showing you. So start sewing. They'll be back next week with, I think it's nine patch. Now in the next section of the show, I want you to come up with me and look at a very beautiful quilt. Each week I'll be showing you some contemporary quilts with a traditional kind of look. And this is a very special quilt to me because I think it says a lot about what's currently going on, what the interests of quilt makers are today. This is a Boise Peace Project quilt. They've done 25 quilts, all to raise people's awareness of the fact that we need to do something about the idea of peace today. This particular quilt was done with a group of Soviet women. The Soviet women did the central panel and the borders, and the American women did these wonderful portraits of Soviet and American children. They're 40 little pictures in all. The idea is it's hard to tell which are the Soviet children and which are the American, and that's the whole idea of the quilt, that they are no different, that they all have to need a secure future, and that's what this group is working for. In another part of the show, I want you to take a look at quilts that you have in your family. And I know a lot of you have them, so I've talked to Rod Kirikoff, who will be with us each week, and he's going to talk about those exact kind of quilts that you have at home, starting with the old favorite grandmother's flower garden. Rod Kirikoff is an internationally recognized authority on quilts. He co-founded the Quilt Digest Press in San Francisco and has helped museums and individuals form quilt collections. He's just written a book called America's Quilts, Cloth, and Comfort, which is all about the history of American quilts. So I knew he was perfect to tell us more about the kinds of quilts you may have in your family. This is really nice. I like this. I think it's a really pretty little one, too. It's a grandmother's flower garden variation. Mm -hmm. When I was dealing in quilts, I always liked to find variations on a theme or just something a little quirky. Yeah, I've never seen one like this before. But it's, it's based on the traditional grandmother flower garden with your hexagon center. A traditional one would be built up of, of rows of the hexagons, uh -huh. a print, and then a solid, and then a print forming kind of the, the flower, a rosette, uh -huh. the flower garden. What she's done here is, is just used a larger hexagon, and she's made it with triangles. She's used the three solids. She made more work for herself, didn't Definitely. she? Definitely. <laughs> and then her prints. And she's taken the color of her solids from the print fabric. Um, women who made quilts, just they loved their fabrics, and they always used it to kind of decide for them the colors mm -hmm. and, and what they're going to do. But I love those prints. The well, they're, they're very typical prints from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Now, I, I do know that this one was made in the 1930s because I do know the maker on this. Okay, on those prints, I was going to ask you, if someone has a quilt, and these are so common, how do you tell a 30s print from, say, an 1860s print? Well, as a general rule, with the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s prints, they're going to be in pastel mm -hmm. shades, as you can see here this more pastel, the colors here, they just have a softer, more pastel look. Kind of a sherbet color, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. And the scale of the prints, do they vary a great deal? Well, no, because you can see here, you've got small prints and then mm -hmm. you've got larger prints. And then over here, you have some larger prints. So it's more just the coloration and then also, you, Anyone who's wanting to learn to date their quilts mm -hmm. needs to be f familiar with the patterns of the period. And certainly Grandmother's Flower Garden was one, one of the, the most. most. I wanted to ask you about this too. Is this a clue to the 30s? You often see a scallop border. 
Yes, well, here she just followed the, the edge of her hexagon and, and, and bound it that way. The same with the double wedding ring quilts mm -hmm. of this same time period with the, the curve. They just bound it on the curve. Um, so that, that is another clue. A lot of the quilts from this time will just have the edge of the pattern and, and finished it, it in that way. Makes a beautiful way. edge, doesn't it? Yes, it really does. This is, I like the way that it almost looks like a ribbon that's twisting. Yes. We're back now with a special guest. I wanted to think of who would be the perfect person to give you kind of an overview of this latest quilt revival. And so I couldn't think of anyone better than Bonnie Lehman. Bonnie's the editor of Quilter's newsletter magazine, and I know a lot of you know that. I thought she'd be able to kind of tell us what's been going on from her special viewpoint. Bonnie, I think you've probably seen more slides of quilts <laughs> than anyone over these years. I was interested in the fact that you started the magazine at a time when women were quilting, but there wasn't a lot of activity. What got you started in the very beginning on it? Uh, I was a freelance writer trying to do work at home, and among the ideas I had was mail order. So I was trying some quilt patterns through mail order, mm -hmm. having discovered a notebook of my mother's patterns that she had saved. Mm -hmm. So your mother was a quilt maker? Well, she wanted to be. She saved these patterns. Uh -huh. uh, my aunt made quilts, my whole family, but my mother, I think, just wanted to and never got around to very much real sewing. You were really in the right place at the right time because you were the first person to really get going before the shows started. I know for me, what you did was to let me know more than in any other way what was happening, who the people were. You had a broad outlook from the very beginning of showing just exactly everything that was happening. How did you decide that, you know, in what tone to take for the magazine? Just a curiosity? Well, curiosity, and I was learning myself along the way, too. and. Uh, as I discovered what was going on more and more, I, that was what I wished to show, mm -hmm. try to present the whole spectrum of what all the quilt makers were doing. You did that. You did that really well. You were one of the first ones to show contemporary quilts way, way mm -hmm. back. One of the things that fascinates me is you were doing this literally in the beginning, you and your husband on your, I'm assuming, kitchen table or basement. <laughs> That's true, in the garage even. With seven children. Yes. So um, you must have an interesting viewpoint of what women can do with their time. Mm. Well, uh, yes, I guess so. <laughs> I think the idea is that you just, uh, you're organized, you work hard, and you, you keep doing that over and over. And little by little, you little can by get little. a lot done. Mm -hmm. what do you see quilting doing? What does it do for you? What do you see it really doing for women on a whole? Oh, so many things. It's just been um, an eye-opener, I think, to so many women to learn what they're capable of. They've learned to be independent, mm -hmm. have careers, at the same time uh, be with their families. They've learned about the world and their creative abilities. It's been a great thing. So it's not too late for anybody to join this movement. Oh, no. <laughs> Never too late. <laughs> Never. Now, I asked you to kind of think of slides of uh, quilts that had had an impact that maybe said something about the time periods that you made. What's this one? Um, this is Nancy Halpern? Uh, Falls Island, Reversing Falls. Uh, Nancy Halpern, yes, made this in 1977. It was one of the first uh, abstract quilts. It's beautiful. These are all quilts that have appeared in your magazine. Right, this all of them. This is kind of an overview. Who's, whose is this? This is uh, Jean Johnson, Into the Wind. She was one of the first to do s strip piecing that represented pictorial subjects. And that's really a new kind of form that took yes, off during right. the 70s and 80s. This I love is, this. Oh, I love it. Uh, Terry Mann gets school days. Um, she was uh, among the first to do what we called art quilts. I called Terry for the first time after seeing that quilt uh -huh. in your magazine. This one I remember. Oh, this is wonderful. George Washington and Valley Forge by Chris Wolf Edmonds in 1976. It won the major bicentennial contest at that time. Interesting. We'll be showing a completely different 
uh, quilt by Chris yes, later on Yes, our style has changed. Exactly. And this is Monica Calvert's Glorious Lady Freedom, which won a $20,000 award Ooh. in 1986. <laughs> Probably, I guess it's the quilt that's won the most money. This is Jenny Byers' Ray of Light, 1978. Was the major winner in the Good Housekeeping yeah, Contest at that, that time. This is Neighbors of the World by Erica Odemer in Munich. Won the contest that Quilters Newsletter Magazine sponsored at the first Quilt Expo Europa in 1988. It's called, as I said, Neighbors of the World. So what you've shown us is it's really a worldwide movement now. It truly is. Thank you very much for being with us, Bonnie. You're welcome. I feel kind of like we've just flipped through 22 years of Quilter's newsletter. Please be with us next week. We'll be watching for you.